open government, so he might want to join our conversations. And if your little ones uh, are wanting to learn about open government, they are more than welcome to join us too. We welcome open government enthusiasts of all ages. Um, but uh, it's kind of ironic, at least uh, for us at the Open Contracting Partnership, that as we've been dealing with this change of how we work, uh, we've also been working harder than ever because the COVID-19 crisis has really uh, shot up the amount of uh, demand for, for our support. And I imagine, uh, Claire, that it's been similar for you at the International Budget Partnership or the IBP, uh, where you engage a lot with ministries of finance and civil society around how to make budgeting more effective and participatory. How's it been for you? Yeah, no, I'm great. No, thanks, Lindsay. No, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, these are trying times for everyone and everyone's impacted, particularly people facing extraordinary displacement or economic hardships. And uh, I mean, this is a, a time of massive interventions and urgent interventions. We, we think these interventions need to be characterized by honesty and transparency and engagement and public trust. And these are the very objectives that are driving our work. So we're excited that with partners around the world, we recently released the Open Budget Survey, which shows some of the potential threats in the response to the COVID um, pandemic, including the opacity of, of public uh, spending, of extra budgetary funds, as, uh, as well as debt, but also lack of public engagement and spaces to participate as well as weak oversight in, in execution of the budget. So we are working with our partners around the world because we see that there's hope and that change is possible as well. So we're engaging with diverse actors from social movements and think tanks and international non-governmental organizations, as well as global bodies like UNICEF and the International uh, Development Initiative of International Organization of National Audit Offices. And we're engaging with governments to publish timely information guided by public demand. So open spaces for all people, particularly those from marginalized communities to participate, strengthen monitoring and oversight and sustain these practices beyond political shifts. Uh, so we're excited to engage with everyone. We're excited to engage with everyone here today. But how about you at OCP? I know you're, you're working with governments and civil society to make public contracting more transparent and accountable. How is it going for you this difficult time? Yeah, the last two months have been very intense for our partners. Um, most of the public contracting systems around the world were just not designed to be both speedy and accountable at the same time. And as a result, most of the government agencies are really scrambling to secure the needed medical equipment. There's <clears throat> poor coordination and very little transparency. And this situation has actually resulted in what we're calling the Hunger Games scenario where hospitals, agencies, and even different levels of government are actually bidding against each other driving up prices, leading to shortages, and it's actually enabled some pretty serious incidents of fraud and corruption. Um, so to meet this challenge, we've been supporting our government partners to design more effective emergency procedures and to collect and publish data about the emergency response procurement, including you know, the most important things, what, what is being bought, how much is being bought, from who, and has it been delivered. Um, we're also supporting civil society organizations, researchers, and journalists uh, to investigate and monitor the effectiveness and integrity of these contracts. And of course, in addition to all of this new work that we have focused around COVID-19, there's also all of the other uh, public contracting that goes on every day to secure public infrastructure and public services. And as we go into the COVID-19 recovery, uh, all of our work on wider reforms will become uh, even more intense. So I'm really happy that we're co-hosting this call together, Claire, uh, Open Contracting Partnership and the International Budgeting Partnership, because I think today with this group of expert practitioners we have on the phone with us and I'm so excited to introduce you for our, our panelists to introduce ourselves. Um, open budgeting and open contracting are both going to be so important for the open response and open recovery. Absolutely. So we believe that open and accountable budgeting and contracting are, are more critical than ever. So we're here today to discuss how can we strengthen transparency and accountability and public procurement and budgeting processes. We'd love to learn from, from your experiences, the challenges you faced, what has worked for you, and what can we do going forward to forge an open and accountable path. 
So we have a fantastic group of panelists and contributors. We want to keep this session lively. We invite you to continue introducing yourselves in the chat. Let us know what, what you're up to and, and how you can contribute as well to the pandemic response and recovery. So I'm going to pass over now to our, our panelists. It'd be great if you could quickly just introduce yourself, your name, your, your role and uh, your, your country. Uh, I'll, I'll pass first to, to Pablo, then Jeanette, Ikram and Lorena, please. Over to you just to introduce yourselves. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pablo Seid. I'm National Director of the National Directorate of Public Procurement from Paraguay. Great, thank you. And Jeanette, over to you. Good morning, everyone from Chile. I'm uh, Janet von Wolfersdorf, the executive director from Observatory for Fiscal Spending, an NGO working for more transparent procurement and better spending, and also president of the Commission of Public Spending, uh, our finance ministry recently released. Uh, good morning to everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. And Saeed Ikram Afsali from Afghanistan. Over to you, please, Ikram. Well, thank you. Um, so my name is Saeed Ikram Afsali, and I'm executive director of um, Integrity Watch. And we have been working on anti-corruption issues since uh, 2005. Great, thank you. Welcome, Ikram. And over to you, Lorena. Hi, I am Lorena Rivero. I am uh, representing the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency. I am the manager for technical cooperation and collaboration. And for those who do not know, gift. We are a network of ministries of finance, civil society organizations that like to discuss an, an uh, overview and control budgets and spending and taxing and stuff. And uh, of course, international organizations uh, that are is interested in this uh, financial side, the IMF, the World Bank, IFEC, of course, the IBP. So we are a network of a uh, fiscal transparency. Great, thank you so much. And we'll have a chance to, to um, invite other colleagues to join us after the first round of, of questions as well. So thank you so much. Again, please continue to continue the lively discussion. But first, I'm going to pass over to Pablo, please. Um, and you've talked about in Paraguay, um, not only one, but two viruses that we have to confront. And we'd love to hear about the, the situation in Paraguay and how have you been addressing the crisis? Well, thank you very much. Well, I want to talk, first of all, about the risk. I don't want to sound negative, but risk is an element or our element that we should take into account always in public procurement. Of course, I will focus my, my speech, my presentation in public procurement over budgeting because we, I am International Director of Public Procurement. So uh, we agree the last week in the WTO webinar about which are the main risks in the public procurement system, especially in those crisis situations, the crisis situation that we have now. Both risks are don't procure, that means don't procure in time, quality and quantity expected, and of course, corruption, which is causing collusion. So basically, both risks are normally present in the in the public procurement system, but in the situation that we have now, the level of the risk increased a lot. Uh, how much is not possible to measure yet, but I'm sure that social, uh, civil social organizations will find the way to measure how much increased the level of those risks uh, during the crisis. But we have a, a good news. Both risks uh, 
will decrease with one element that we probably know the answer, which one will be the element, of course, is transparency. Transparency and publicity, is causing always, um, represent a, a, a very effective remedy against those risks. Transparency means more information. More information means more offerers. More offerers means, uh, or be uh, better yet, ensure better offers, disconnected offers, which decrease the level of collusion, and more information and more transparency means less brokers. That means shorter commercial change. Because one big problem that we all have now in all procurement system is the, uh, the new development of brokers around the world. And brokers in the, in the health system, in the health change procurement are a big risk because normally you have a, a, a broker change that are with an expertise already uh, in, in the field that uh, allows you government to feel comfortable of how are you dealing and what are you buying. But now you have a lot of new brokers, a lot means thousands of new brokers in the market and you don't know the, the experience of those brokers, especially in the health industry. So it is a big risk to have new uh, players in the public procurement system without exp experience and without a specific experience in the uh, health industry. Another point that I have to mention is uh, about open data and transparency. Open data is for transparency what internet was for publicity in the 90s. While uh, publicity allows us to know what decisions took the authority, transparency allows us to know why the authority took the decision and if the decision is legitimate or not. We, of course, are fighting always for transparency. Open data is today for me is the best way to, to show transparency to the public because it go deep narrow in, in, in the decision, not only in the form, in the, in the way the decision looks for the society. And as I told, as I mentioned, sorry, the, the last week in the, in the webinar, for bureaucracy and for administrations, transparency is the tool to survive. And why not? For society, transparency is the only way to survive in this crisis. Uh, where do we want to be as a society in the crisis? And here I would like to quote uh, Yuval Harari, which presents us a map uh, which includes four points, four cardinal points. In the national field, you may uh, look, at, you, you may find a totalitarian surveillance or a citizen empowerment. In the international field, you may find a national isolate, nationalist insul, isolation or a global solidarity. Where do we want to be as society in the map, in this map, which present to us Mr. Harari? I like the, the, the way he showed to us where do we want to be? Uh, and I'm sure which will be your answer. I won't, I won't give the answer, but uh, if you're thinking in citizen empowerment, if you're think, thinking in global solidarity, transparency is the base of everything. If you want to talk about um, public procurement that joint needs of different countries to, uh, to, to work better as a, a, as a big market and to fight better against the, chain, uh, to the supply chain chaos, you have to present transparency, you have to present complete information. You have to be complete honest with your data as a country. If you want to empower your citizen to fight in the national level against the crisis, of course you have to have transparency as the main political, political goal in your national system, not only procurement system, but also budgeting system, but also administrative system. So once again, transparency is the main key. Now I want to talk about public procurement system and pandemic specific. 
what is the main action for a public procurement system right now? Basically the same, organize, offer and demand. The, char the characteristic of the market, of course, of course, sorry, change a lot. The global situation is a chaos regarding supply chain, regarding logistic and, and other problems that you know better than me. But uh, so what, 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 what we have to do from uh, the public procurement system is basically, basically combine the classic elements, transparency, efficiency, quality, and price in a better way in even a better way. Normally, we fight to combine those four, element, four elements in the procurement system all the time to find the better way. But in this situation, it's even more important to be faster in the response from the, from the public procurement system, to be, uh, of course, more efficient and more transparent from the public procurement system to provide the information about how are we mixing, mix it, mixing sorry, those four elements. What is the main role of the public procurement system? I, find, I found two, two main roles, the uh, procurement facilitation and to use the public procurement system to accelerate the, re the economic recovery. So, Normally, we, we use the, the public procurement system to facilitate the procurement, to obtain the product and the service that we need. But now, especially in this situation uh, that we have in the economic, from the economic point of view, we have to use, we, I mean, the whole society have to use the public procurement system uh, to accelerate the economy, reco the, 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 the recovery of the economy. Uh, we have to take into account that public procurement normally represent about 12% of the GPD, about 25% of the national budget in the different countries. And as I always say, it is the most important 12% of the GDP probably. It's the 12% that the state, the government may control, may point, is a 12% that may goes in, in a better way to SMEs than big enterprises, for example, is on 12% that may create more jobs than other percent of the GPD. So we have to use those billions of dollars, this 12%, 12% in a better way, thinking not only into procure, but also into accelerate the, uh, the recovery of the economy. And finally, I want, I want to show you some examples of specific actions that we took here in the National Directorate. Um, and I want to classify it into groups, transparency and facilitation. About transparency, we, we create a toolkit control for citizens. Uh, we sell the idea of be a controller of the public procurement. And the role of controller is not only for uh, national authorities, but mainly for the citizen. So we give the citizen a, a toolkit to control what we, the authorities, are doing with his money uh, regarding public procurement, especially for public procurement COVID-19. We produce online information and we show online information about COVID-19 public procurement, including direct purchases. Uh, this is a, a, a main element in our actions uh, to include direct pro procurement and direct purchases in the online information because, of course, direct purchases represent an uh, increase uh, in risk levels. Uh, we start more than 70 investigation process regarding possible irregularities in the public procurement uh, process. Uh, we, out, uh, uh, we also give the opportunity to live broadcasting bid opening event to the different uh, uh, procurement entities. And we, of course, present our open data portal as the main tool to know everything about the public procurement uh, process and system. The open data portal of our, of the, our national directorate provide not only the, authority, but the authorities, but also 
the, the, the society and the special uh, organized society uh, members a specific information that they are starting to use to know what the government is doing regarding public procurement. And I mean starting to use because, because I'm sure that they may, uh, they may develop better ways to know, to cross the information and better ways to present what we are doing. And regarding facilitations, we uh, produce some guides uh, for the public buyers, uh, for the offers to make easier uh, to understand the system. And by system, I mean the informatic system and uh, the whole complex uh, of, of rules that, uh, that are the, the, the public procurement system. We also have a, a database of products available in the market, not as offers, not as formal offers, but uh, just a, a, a database of informal products of, of and service uh, information that the private sector provides to the public buyers to know what also they may buy to, uh, to, to, to be in a better and safer way during the, the pandemic. And, and we have some, some aggressive actions regarding uh, our, our informatic system. We create a virtual store specific for, for COVID-19 products. And we also create a virtual store with, with, with uh, which, sorry, will start the next week uh, for innovative national industry products. Thinking especially in SMEs that need to transform the way they are doing business and even the product that they are commercializing to, 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 to to try to, to involve those small SMEs, national industries with the public government in the public procurement uh, environment. And uh, we also designed a, a system for electronic bids. Uh, probably electronic bids are the, the more aggressive uh, actions uh, regarding digitalization and public procurement. And we will start with the first uh, EBIT procurement next week, so you will know about it. Well, basically, and to, for conclusion, we have one of a kind opportunity to increase the level of transparency and social involvement in public procurement with this crisis. So not everything is negative. We have a big opportunity here. We have a big opportunity here, and we have to use it. Thank you very much. Great, Pablo. Muchas gracias. You've highlighted some of the concrete steps that countries can take, governments can take in terms of strengthening transparency through open data portals, for example, and strengthening social engagement in, in the process. You've also challenged us to think about the kind of societies we want to create. So thank you for that. And with that, I'll, I'll turn to Jeanette in, in Chile. Um, Jeanette, we've heard a few things about uh, how we strengthen societies, how we involve different actors in the role of of budgeting and, and procurement. Could you share some more of your experience of, of holding governments to account of uh, ensuring that decisions are made openly and, uh, and with inclusion? So over to you to share your experience and, and lessons for the ways forward. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. Uh, as Pablo said, uh, yes, we all know we are in very hard times. And um, uh, these uh, hard times are especially hard times for the most smallest, uh, the most vulnerable ones. But um, we are also in, in times of change. And um, as Pablo said, uh, now transparency is even more important than ever because um, more transparency will give more voice and more power to those who are powerless uh, and um, are especially the most vulnerable ones. So that is our, um, yeah, our objectives as NGO, our aim to, to contribute uh, uh, during this crisis uh, to, uh, to more transparency 
from the Chilean civil society, we are working mainly on two levels. We are working on data analytics and we are also working on advocacy. Uh, on data analytics, uh, for us uh, during the crisis, procurement data are very important because uh, they are more, more timely than budget execution data as well. And um, they have uh, special risks, uh, especially right now when procurement um, is being pushed uh, without uh, so much competition. Uh, so, uh, from our uh, NGO, the Observatory of Fiscal Standing, we are um, making uh, data analytics uh, public, uh, showing changes in procurement during March. For example, we have daily updated dashboards um, uh, uh, that show um, a timely concentration aspects, for example, uh, procurement without competition. We will be soon releasing some price monitoring of special products as well. We are working with help of uh, uh, data scientists and uh, we are also preparing some uh, analytics on and visualizations on construction tenders. Uh, we will be working together with the um, construction ministry and also with the private union, the construction union to make uh, price comparisons uh, uh, for uh, public construction. So uh, procurement data is very important uh, and also how to make a constant uh, monitoring on procurement. And uh, there we are working um, with open contracting partnership uh, in, in a project to build up a red flag system to, uh, to, to open uh, the risks of uh, tenders uh, to all the public um, with a system of red flags. So we are working on that, uh, hoping to push that during this year in some month uh, and uh, to, to show uh, daily the risks in procurement. Spending data are more um, are not so timely. So we'll we will be uh, just analyzing spending data in some days when we get the data of March. But uh, for us, the most important thing is data analytics right now, and uh, we think that uh, the transparency of data is crucial. Um, for uh, uh, incentives for good spending, preventing uh, problems. So this is one, one thing we are doing, all the data analytics and being um, a, a, a foundation that works with data, we also know what data are missing. This is the other part, because when we are asking for more accountability, it's, it's not just a general quest, a request, but we are uh, asking government to release specific data sets because we know the data sets that are missing because we are working with the data sets. So uh, there I will start with the most, um, uh, most crucial one, health data. And I think uh, health data are indirectly related to procurement and spending data, but they're very important because they justify the, the spending afterwards. But at least in Chile, we don't have good data on who is being tested, how are patients, um, the evolution of death rates, and so on. We just get general statistics and uh, always in an aggregated way. Uh, that is just what the, the health ministry wants to show us. So um, we didn't resolve that part yet, but um, to say something very positive, I think in our democracy in Chile, we never talked so much about data uh, and we never talked so much from so many different uh, NGOs, uh, academies, from so, so many different persons that data are crucial for our democracy. So I see really a change on that. We are working since like five years with data on public spending and procurement and now uh, the voices asking for more data are really uh, loud in, in, in Chile and this is very positive. So there will be lessons for democracy afterwards because now so many liberties are being restricted by governments in the name of coronavirus 
This is important, but there's also huge risks of political abuse of these restrictions as well. For example, at least in Chile, I see a risks that, uh, that we are trying to, to open our economy. That is very important, but uh, still um, inequality and social protests are in suspense. So when government maintains in suspense the social movement, but tries to open the economy, what, what are the data that justify these decisions are not clear in Chile. And therefore, our call is please to open more data, to get trust in government, because government may be right what uh, they are doing, but we don't understand them. So this is really a debate about democracy, in, in, in my opinion. And um, well, besides health data, there are, of course, spending data and procurement data. And uh, there I can tell you a more successful experience from Chile, because um, recently uh, we released together with the Committee of Public Spending, that is a committee, independent committee created by the finance minister uh, for better spending. Uh, together with this committee, we released official recommendations of transparency uh, anonymously. And our NGO, in fact, is part of that committee. And during this year, we have also the presidency. So what was most important to do these concrete recommendations on transparency for public spending related to the crisis or in procurement related to the crisis was already having an instance um, for coordination with government. We didn't just to, to we, we didn't have to create one. We had already this uh, instance for coordination with the finance ministry. And this commission really, I think, uh, is a good example because uh, we have uh, members from civil society, we have members from academy, a past budget director, ex-congressman, -ex and think tanks from different political sensibilities. So it's not a, a political think tank. No, we are really a device group and we're making recommendation in a constructive way. Uh, this is a pilot project, but uh, hopefully it could end up in creating something like a permanent fiscal body making permanent uh, recommendations regarding civic participation and transparency of spending and procurement. So our recommendations uh, regarding transparency and accountability in the budgeting and procurement process under the emergency uh, were in, in, including recommendations on transparency of budget reallocations that are really important to understand public procurement uh, data in the crisis to identify the specific procurement uh, better uh, and to understand types and sizes of enterprises that receive some kind of govern governmental support as well, to understand whether the fiscal packages are going to the most vulnerable ones or who is really benefiting. Uh, so we asked not only for more transparency regarding uh, fiscal movements and procurement, but also about the results of these funds. And uh, I must say this work wasn't just created by us neither. We, we got very inspired by recommendations of Transparency International. Uh, I think during the crisis, it's more important than ever to, to join synergies with other organizations and see what other already recommended to build things more together. Our observatory made specific data recommendations. The IMF uh, made recommendations. We analyzed the, the United Nations as well. And the result was not only a document, but a very concrete list of several data sets and reports to be published. And I, I will cite this as a positive um, um, example because the finance minister reacted very positive while receiving the recommendations. He, he didn't understand that as a critics on, on the lack of transparency, but as an opportunity to make a step forwards. And we understand he already is working on a specific channel, a website, 
where all the information uh, for accountability will be put together to make it easy to make uh, monitoring from civil society. So uh, this is very, very important for us. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I want to say um, that better accountability uh, is not only important during the crisis and regarding funds uh, and relationship with the crisis, but also it's the moment to make structural reforms in transparency in general. For example, the open budget survey recently released already served uh, for discussions with our finance ministry to ask what can we do better how other countries are doing what better than Chile? How can we learn from others to push transparency in general? Because uh, uh, one thing is uh, the crisis right now, but we know that during and after the crisis, the fiscal situation will be so tight that we must concentrate as never before on efficiency in, uh, of public spending. And therefore we need benchmarks, we need to learn from each other. And at least in Chile, yes, we are working and with, um, with the finance ministry asking for that to work, please help us from society, civil society to push uh, a package of uh, modernizations for our um, uh, budget system to be more efficient. So this is the work we are trying to do from the Commission. I, I think it's very positive because it's also time for structural reforms, not just for more transparency regarding the funds uh, related to the crisis. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That's uh, very powerful. You've highlighted the need for, for transparency as we build democracies, as we build economies, as we build societies. Also how we channel the frustrations of diverse voices around the protests in Chile into constructive dialogue with government. And so thank you for, for sharing the work that you're doing and, and how we can contribute to, to structural and other reforms in our countries. So we'd now like to turn over to, to Ekrem in Afghanistan. Uh, we've learned over several crises that uh, evidence and evidence shows that crises can provide impetus for greater improvements in fiscal openness. We also know that citizen monitoring and citizen engagement can contribute to more effective public procurement and to greater service delivery. Could you share a bit more about the work that you have done, Ikram, in Afghanistan, how you've engaged government uh, to strengthen budgeting and contracting? Thanks so much, Ikram. Well, thank you, Claire and Nancy, for, for this opportunity. Um, so I think Pablo and, and Janet both uh, have talked about um, the importance of, of public procurement and transparency around it. I think it's also important to unpack this and what it means for the ordinary citizens. And I hope I'll be able to, to speak about this, you know, presenting our example from Afghanistan. Um, you know, at the moment, um, we don't have too many cases in Afghanistan. There are probably about you know, 3,000 uh, cases as, as the curve is picking up. And I hope it doesn't pick up too much. Um, uh, and we have about less than, I think, 100 uh, deaths. Um, but majority of these deaths um, uh, are you know, from uh, medical staff and, and doctors, uh, you know, um, our, our first line of defense against, um, against COVID-19. We already don't have a very strong health system in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, uh, having uh, more deaths, um, you know, from from our medical staff and 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 you know our doctors uh, would have not only uh, short-term implications but also long-term implications on 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 health indicators in, in Afghanistan. So, you know, and and. We have been hearing news about misuse and corruption. Uh, recently, there was a report about um, procurement of uh, substandard uh, sanitizers for um, a hospital that was designated as specialized hospital for COVID-19. Um, and later on, the the you know uh, it was found that uh, the sanitizers didn't have um, any alcohol uh, element in it. Which you know posed um, all the you know medical staff to the risk of uh, contracting the virus, um, and 
you know, this this is like a kind of news that we hear uh, from different corners of the country, um, not having access to, um, you know, personal uh, protection equipment um, is, is another problem that is, is continuously, um, you know, raised in, in the media and also by our uh, local volunteers who monitor services at the local level. So what we decided at Integrity Watch to do is to collect data um, uh, from health centers on preparedness of these health centers in terms of access to PPEs and, uh, you know, ventilators, for example, and, you know, train medical staff if they have um, enough staff in, in, in the health centers. Um, and this data um, is something that would um, not only help in terms of identifying where our uh, the risk areas and you know where um, the government should uh, pay more attention, but it also hopefully will help in terms of uh, better planning and budgeting. Um, and and you know something again that, that we have uh, done and, and hopefully we'll launch a report very soon about you know our, a study of 50 health uh, centers and hospitals uh, where we assess quality of of these uh, health centers and you know you know also uh, operation and maintenance and hygiene. Of, of these uh, health centers. This data, which shows that um, a lot of these centers are uh, facing um, some uh, very basic issues uh, due to not having any budget for uh, operation and maintenance. Uh, this could feed into, into uh, hopefully into the policy uh, uh, level. And um, I hope that the government will uh, basically listen to these findings and um, address uh, these issues. Um, our community-based monitoring, um, you know, since we, um, since 2010, we have been working on this and um, we have been working also with health centers since the last two years. Uh, we, in response to COVID-19, we increased um, our uh, number of health centers that we cover. We uh, almost tripled it um, to about 200 health centers where we um, basically empower communities to monitor health services. Um, and, um, you know, wherever we went to and to these, uh, you know, communities, uh, none of the health centers um, had an active health council, which is supposed to be, um, you know, a council composed of um, uh, health administrators at the local level and also community representatives, but none of them were, were, were um, active. Um, and after our, um, you know, facilitation and mobilization of the community, uh, now the health centers have these uh, councils and they meet um, on a regular basis, uh, not only to, um, to assess quality of health services, but also, um, you know, once the problems are identified um, at the local level, to advocate for solving those problems. And, you know, lucky we had, um, although the program, program is very new, we had uh, about 45% fixed rate um, in, in health centers where we, we worked with. Um, but also we had examples where communities came forward and provided their resources to, uh, uh, you know, address some of the problems at the, at the health centers, um, including building, you know, waiting rooms, for example, providing drinking water and, um, you know, in response to COVID-19, for example, providing, um, you know, equipment for hygiene and, um, you know, uh, like uh, providing liquid soap and, you know, water. So those kind of initiatives were taken at the community level. Um, so what we are hoping is that um, all the data that we have collected through community-based monitoring through volunteers and you know, the surveys that we have done um, and also the study that we have done of the health centers, this data hopefully will, will feed into uh, the, the policy level and into the budget. Um, that, um, and especially that the government is now uh, working to amend the um, this year's budget to in response to uh, COVID-19 uh, because it, it is facing you know uh, limited uh, in a situation where they don't have enough funds to address different aspects of of COVID-19 so in response to that they are working to um, uh, amend the budget so I hope that this uh, uh, data will feed into uh, the new budgeting uh, process and um, you know, recently we had discussions with the Ministry of Finance, and uh, we, uh, the, the, the Deputy Minister of Finance, promised to uh, take um, our, our, uh, our, our uh, findings into account 
uh, and to increase public participation. Um, so I hope that uh, with this data from the ground, you know, we would be able to um, influence the government to have um, basically uh, these uh, uh, issues taken into account. Um, and um, of course, I mean, there was also commitment from the government that they will publish data, although we are facing problems with, uh, you know, proactive disclosure because um, a lot of uh, the information uh, that we used to uh, get from these different ministries um, are no, no longer available um, because the ministries are under lockdown and, and their staff are not available or working from home. So uh, a proactive disclosure basically by, by uh, these uh, uh, different government entities would help uh, to um, um, give us the information based on which we can do our social audits, for example, uh, with different uh, local um, civil society organizations. So we hope that you know, uh, going forward, um, learning from our experiences of open government partnership, where we had a very um, uh, wide uh, consultation with the public uh, at uh, a provincial level and at the local level. Uh, we hope that um, uh, we would be able to uh, use um, uh, you know, uh, this, this experience to engage more with the public in order to, um, to get the procurement data um, and, and budget data um, and, and to analyze that and, and to carry out social audits and, and monitoring of government uh, emergency procurement um, and be able to um, uncover um, misuses where, where it has happened. So um, we really hope that this uh, would help um, connect um, the high level uh, you know, um, issues of public procurement that we have been speaking about with the issues that people are facing on daily basis uh, at the grassroots level. Great. No, thank you so much, Ikram. And it's very exciting to hear about all the work that you're doing, building on your community-based monitoring experience and linking that, of course, with discussion at the national level. We're very excited about the OGP commitment on public participation in the budgeting process as well and look forward to supporting you in that. Um, we do want to make sure we have time for a lively, lively discussion. Um, and, and we've seen several requests from colleagues in, in uh, Kenya, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone as well. So we will continue to share tools and strategies uh, online and offline. But now I just want to pass over to Lorena from GIFT, who can also share some insights. Uh, we've had a chance, obviously, you've been coming from the government of Mexico, where you worked on budgeting and, and contracting, now working with GIFT and technical collaboration and supporting many governments and civil societies to strengthen fiscal openness. Perhaps you can share your experience and lessons. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, so first off, um, I wanted to, to do a bit of, of framing on the complexity of the implications when we speak about fiscal right now. Because this, and in Mexico, we had a case of the earthquake and we had economic crisis and doing fiscal transparency for that. But this turns out to be something, um, something different. Why? Uh, we have very complex implications now that are different than another health, pan, um, health crisis that can be in one country or one region because we have different implications and it has spurred to different parts of the economy. So we have lower market demand, we have less taxes, we have less revenue. So that, that starts to be a much more complex uh, scenario. And it's also different than a natural disaster uh, transparency that we can think of because we don't know when this is gonna finish. We can just start estimating or thinking when this is going to finish, we can make projections. But this is a complication for public financial management because you have the, the stress of not having certainty and you have the uncertainty of markets. And that has important implications of the fiscal as a whole. And of course it has implications on the budget. So decision-making here is a, is a lot more complex than it could have been in other types of emergencies. So, um, and, and in other types of emergencies like natural disasters, we have seen problems of lack of transparency or and scandals or mismanagement in all types of different economies. Uh, we have seen that happening in, um, in New Zealand earthquake. We had it in, um, in um, the recent hurricanes in the US. 
Uh, we had it in, in so many countries. We always have this scandal. And this emergency is much more complex, speaking on the fiscal side. Um, so only in the fiscal sphere, we need a mix of data that requires a lot of coordination. And Janet was all, already mentioning the need for a, this interlinkage with health data. So we need a mix of data that requires co coordination among sectors, agencies, and systems. In a data infrastructure that is not there in many cases, it is not connected enough, or it is not flexible enough for different reasons. And reasons may vary from country to country. So that, that would be a, a whole other discussion of how we can improve systems. But the, the thing is, uh, we have seen this before but it is already much more complex than what we have seen before. So generally speaking and structuring, um, and I didn't wanna go only on the, on the budget side because things are very linked uh, now. now. Um, so we are thinking of the target, the targeted measures that governments are taking. So we have the emergency spending, all the things that have to be related to health, but also security, also going to online education when possible, also pro providing more water and sanitation, and also measures for keeping people under lockdown, providing food. So it is not just about the health anymore. So a health emergency becoming a, an issue for, for other parts of the budget, other sectors. Um, the counter cyclical actions that we have for the stimulus plans. And, and this is where I wanted to, to mention this other complexity coming from, from this pandemic being global and spurring to other parts of the economy, because we have to reactivate the economy in some sort of way, right? We have a decreased demand that is having implications in, in all senses in the economy. And then we have, a, um, impacts on the revenue side right now uh, we have different forms of funding this emergency we have the donor funding we have debt we have increased deficits um, we have the new uh, trust funds that were very very much mentioned in some interactions that we have been uh, having with with civil society particularly in in Africa and Southeast Asia this uh, trust funds that are a combination of public and private uh, resources that you want to know where they came from, but also where they're going, right? So we want, we need to know everything about it. Um, and in all this complex context where we did not have the infrastructure for the data and we don't have it yet and we're not going to have the time to have it during the pandemic. We're going to have to think about it now and implement right after. But governments are passing the cost of gathering the data to the users. So in some countries, the data might be there or might be accessed through information requests. In other countries, it's civil society trying to follow press releases and getting and getting the whole picture together, getting the puzzle together, and then monitoring it directly, as, as is the case, that we ha they have to go to uh, see if certain donor uh, support was provided to where, where it should have been, and so forth. So, so this part of the cost is being passed uh, to the user, and it's very complex to get the whole picture together. So. This brings me to the actual question that, that, that uh, Claire was also asking. Are there any uh, specific examples of, the, uh, of experiences in this? Well, there are quite few. Most of what we have been finding is specific initiatives that are uh, to provide data uh, for other natural disasters cases or some um, the reactivation of the economy or, or stimulus plans, but mainly focusing on spending or procurement, but providing the whole picture 
we have very few, or I would say probably one or two uh, basic cases of this. And this is another, and that's another complication. Um, so how, how do we get the puzzle together, right? And it requires definitely different coordination. And the point of this is to provide the users with the data that they need. And when I am saying users, I'm not just thinking about civil society, which is a very important user, but the user is also the government. The government also needs this data and they don't have it because of this lack of data infrastructure. So uh, uh, it's very, very fast on the GIF network, we're uh, compiling a guide. At least we have 15 data sets and probably more that are required to actually get the fiscal idea together. And these ones have a specific data fields and thinking of the users. So um, we can talk about this after and, and so forth. So part of this conversation. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lorena. Now you've highlighted all the complexities of, of trying to share information, of tracking information, of ensuring performance and results of budgeting and, and contracting processes. And we're exciting to hear more about the examples and, and the guide, of course. We've also shared in the chat more of these examples of the guide from the OGP on, on fiscal openness and procurement as well. So we invite you all to, to look at the guide, contact OCP and IBP as well for, for more resources. And of course, we want to hear more from the voices on the call. I see that Zuki has just joined us as well to share some, some insights. So we're now I'm going to pass over to, to Lindsay to, to facilitate the next uh, few discussions. Thanks so much to all of our, our contributors so far. Yes, thank you so much. And we've been having a lively uh, discussion in the chat as well in parallel uh, and kind of in response to the wonderful remarks being made. Thank you again, uh, Jeanette, Lorena, uh, Ikram and Pablo for your words of wisdom. Uh, so just uh, a little bit of housekeeping uh, to make sure everybody's aware and reminded that this call is uh, being recorded. So now that we're going to be calling on people to speak, just to kind of keep that in mind, the recording will be shared on social media. Um, I've been noting a few few of the of the requests to share uh, from different uh, from different people in the chat over the course of uh, this conversation. I think it's been really interesting how uh, we've had some questions from uh, Krishna, Evelyn, uh, Mogabo, and Ken that have really focused on kind of what to do in these more challenging contexts where, where there is already, there's poor coordination. We don't necessarily, uh, go the government may not necessarily be able to get uh, good data in a timely manner about this COVID purchases, let alone civil society. Uh, so what are some uh, tools and guidance uh, that can be used by civil society in those contexts? We shared uh, some resources over chat, but I think that this might be a good question that maybe Ikram would be well positioned uh, to address because when he started his work in Afghanistan, things were not so transparent. But Ikram, before I get to you, I'm going to just uh, summarize a few of the other things from the chat so that uh, people can prepare themselves on what they're going to say to answer these questions. Um, we also had a question, I think, from Gabriela for uh, Pablo Seitz from Paraguay about how uh, how Paraguay is measuring the success of their intervention. And I might take moderator's privilege, uh, Pablo, to ask you to also talk a little bit what has been the success of maybe the citizens toolkit or the monitoring efforts. You know, have you actually? Uh, detected irregularities or, or prevented any cases of corruption through through these uh, processes you've put in place. Uh, and then I think we had a question about um, the challenge of, uh, of uh, federal federal systems and how we can have better control in federal systems. I think both I think most of the countries represented on this call are centralized systems. So maybe Lorena could answer the question about federalized systems. And then I think that captures most of the conversation that was happening over the chat up till now. Um, while we let Lorena and 
and Ikram and Pablo think about their answers. Ah, there was one more question for Jeanette, which was uh, from Ingrid, which was, okay, you've detected corruption in a civil society like they have in Ecuador, or you've detected not necessarily corruption, but an irregularity, something that doesn't look right. What's the next step that you can take as civil society uh, to try to uh, get some accountability? So that was the question from Ingrid. While the panelists think about their answers, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Andrea Salguero. Uh, she is joining us from Argentina and she is uh, from a Supreme Audit Institution. So Andreas, we'd love to hear your very brief uh, contribution in terms of how, uh, just looking at the time, obviously I'd like to hear all of you for hours and hours and hours, but looking at the time, would love to hear your view kind of coming from an audit institution, you're trying to react to COVID-19 in real time, what is your advice uh, for all of us? Oh, and Andrea, I think you have to um, unmute yourself or I have to unmute you. Hola. There you go, Hola, yes. Hola, sí. <laughs> eh, bueno, eh, muy interesante todas las ponencias. Es cierto, este el desafío de lo que son totalmente las compras y qué pasa con el tema de las compras y los controles, eh, que es un verdadero desafío en este contexto, ¿no? Que estamos todos en casa, digamos. Eh, en particular, eh, lo que nosotros tuvimos que hacer es reformular eh, lo que es la interacción con sociedad civil, porque... ¿Me, me escuchan todos? ¿Sí? Eh, porque eh, al no poder tener reuniones presenciales, eh, tampoco quisimos cortar con, con la incorporación de sociedad civil. Entonces lo que hemos hecho es esto, sumar estrategias de comunicación online o vía Zoom, para que eh, este intercambio y todas aquellas demandas que tenga la sociedad civil vengan de alguna manera a la auditoría y podamos canalizar eh, los pedidos que tengan. De hecho, ahora estamos presentando eh, propuestas de la sociedad civil de temas que quieren que la Auditoría General de la Nación audite precisamente. Algunos van a estar relacionados con este tema y lo hemos hecho a través de formularios online y esto se pasa para que después los equipos de auditoría se fijen cuáles de esos temas pueden ser tenidos en cuenta en la planificación. O sea, nos replanteamos la estrategia ante la no posibilidad de tener talleres presenciales y eh, reuniones y encuentros con sociedad civil, analizar esto a través de encuestas online que algunos equipos de auditoría piden, a través de capacitaciones, vamos a hacer capacitaciones online para que conozcan bien eh, el funcionamiento de la auditoría, las competencias y los informes para que también sociedad civil pueda acercar temas para auditar, que suponemos que muchos van a tener que ver con el tema de estos, principalmente de compras del Estado. ¿no? Thank you so much, Andreas, for that. So now uh, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Ikram to answer the question uh, that so many of our, our, of our friends out there are dealing with, which is when you're in a more challenging context where there is less digitization, less, uh, you know, less connectivity, uh, how to, and less transparency of, in terms of the business practices as we already have them, what are kind of some, some starting advocacy steps um, that can be taken? And I am going to unmute to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I think that's a very uh, important question because uh, monitoring is not possible or maybe as effective uh, without information. And, you know, uh, access to information and, and data uh, has always been a challenge in Afghanistan. So we are, you know, struggling ourselves, you know, to, to get all the information that we need. But of course, there are certain things that you can do in, in the short term and also in the long term. So if you have a, a, an access to information law, um, you know, and you have proactive disclosure um, provisions in, in that law, I think it's uh, something that you can push for um, to, uh, to, to get the government to publish information on, uh, on, on a proactive basis. Um, and of course, I mean, it would be very helpful if they do it through uh, their procurement portals, for example. This is something that we are working with the government at the moment and we are speaking with them. So they are working to 
to get as much information uh, as possible available proactively to the people so that it can be used uh, for, for monitoring by civil society organizations and journalists. So, um, I mean, that's something, you know, you, you can do probably in the, in the short term. Um, and also, I mean, um, you can use your, your FOIA, um, you know, Freedom of Information Act, uh, you know, to ask for information from the government. Um, working with, uh, with with local communities um, and and with uh, civil society groups, I think it's really important to get you know these kind of laws uh, into practice because um, you know from my experience in Afghanistan and you know knowing you know uh, this law exists in many other countries, it's not being used as much as it, it should be. And of course, I mean, I mean, initiatives like the International Budget Partnership, um, you know, the the, the open budget. Um, Survey um, has also contributed to to a certain level of, of um, uh, transparency. So it's important to get these portals, you know, um, to to work for um, you know to be accessible for the people and to to work for uh, you know um, basically connecting uh, people with with these kind of portals so that uh, they know where they can get the data from and and how to use it. Um, in the long term, of course, if if you if you don't have um, you know, a strong um, access to information or Freedom of Information Act. Um, that's something you should start working uh, on now. I think, you know, um, while COVID-19 uh, poses a lot of threats, um, it also offers some opportunities. We, we start to think about uh, doing things differently. And, you know, um, for example, if you have an, uh, an access to information law that does not include uh, accessing, you know, making requests online, for example, that's something that you should put in your advocacy um, to um, to ask the government so that they allow, um, you know, for example, accessing, uh, re requesting information through email, for example. This is something that uh, has been very handy uh, for us in Afghanistan, and we have been able to extract, uh, you know, information from the government uh, during this, um, uh, you know, uh, lockdown uh, even, you know, a lot of ministries are not working. Or working from home, um, you know, it wouldn't have been possible for us without having this provision in the law. So please feel free to use our access to information law as a model, you know, since it's rated uh, very highly at the moment, you know, I think the top access to information law based on um, RTI ratings. Um, so, so that can help you as well. Needless to say, I think building coalitions and, and uh, with the media, with other civil society organizations, to ask the government to, to proactively uh, disclose information um, and and to uh, make data available based on international standards is something that is immensely important. I think um, so. Yes, I think that's that's from you know from my experience what we can basically do. Thank you so much, Ikram. Uh, we also shared in the chat some some helpful resources, including um, specific guidance of of what pieces of information uh, to ask for to be collected in, in terms of the COVID-19 response procurement, but they're good ideas to ask for in general. And, uh, and also, um, we can share some guidance on how to start monitoring. Uh, I think Georg can may be able to share that in the chat. And we also um, are able to help support partners in adapting, you know, simple spreadsheets uh, to start collecting data. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us for that type of support at the Open Contracting Partnership. I might hand it over to Jeanette now to answer the question about what to do when you have detected an irregularity as a civil society organization and what steps you can take uh, to try to get some accountable response from government. And I'm going to unmute you now. A yeah, very important question because, uh, of course, it's not enough just to um, detect uh, some uh, anomalous movements um, uh, or um, a comp a tenders without competition, but uh, the question is what to do afterwards. And I think, uh, at least for us in Chile, um, we saw that it's um, very, very helpful one, to connect data analytics with um, advocacy and uh, outreach. Once you have uh, some kind of, um, uh, of study or some kind of information um, uh, from the data, uh, what we are doing is not only con we are not we are not only contacting just congressmen, but uh, for example, um, in relationship to this crisis, 
we connected to the whole network of NGOs working for open government. So we had, for example, 50 NGOs asking for government together to release more data. Uh, and uh, on the other side, we also work together with journalism, with investigative journalism. And I think the combination of data analytics together with journalism is very powerful because you need to communicate uh, what you find in the data to make uh, the, the most positive pressure possible to get changes done. And then afterwards you have to insist in the changes and have to remember and remember and remember. And at least uh, this uh, formula to uh, work together with journalism and to remember and remember and remember working with the press based on data uh, in Chile was for us very successful. For example, we detected movements um, and uh, tenders without competition, without control in the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry. And right now um, we're in the last steps of uh, legal improvements of a law that uh, uh, will include our uh, recommendations regarding better control on who decides what uh, medicine should be bought. So we are not just only working with data, but we are making the outreach to Congress afterwards. And we're trying to uh, unify our voices together with other civil society organizations. We are not building this world alone. Um, we are strong just together and we're working with the press and investigative journalism and this helps a lot to get uh, more voices uh, in society and make more positive pressure to get better regulations. And so this is our formula. Thank you so much, uh, Jeanette, um, because that's definitely the most uh, critical part uh, is the feedback loop, right? What what we call the feedback loop. You need to have that communication between um, di different actors in order to make change happen. Uh, and that's the promise of open government after all. So I think we're gonna now go back, go back to Pablo. Uh, there were a few uh, questions uh, directed your way and just to remind you about what they were. Uh, it was, uh, how are you measuring uh, the, the, the effectiveness of, of your response in terms of uh, you know, whether procurement is meeting the objectives of meeting the COVID-19 challenge? And also, um, what uh, was the, uh, has there been any uh, effectiveness in terms of using the data for monitoring? And there was a question also that ju just from the chat recently from Mukalani as well, which was kind of trying to get at the idea of, let me go back and find it, about how uh, there's bid wars happening uh, between countries and also even within countries. You know, Paraguay is a smaller, a smaller country, maybe a smaller market. Is open contracting uh, something that is can be leveraged uh, in order to kind of uh, prevent these bid wars or reduce them from happening as governments might even be bidding against uh, private uh, wholesalers or retailers in, in trying to get access to personal protective equipment. So I'm going to unmute you now, Pablo, so you can share your experience. Well, thank you very much. Well, the, the first question liked me a lot, how to measure tech success. It sounds like we already have a success to measure. I don't know if we have a success yes, yet, but um, if, we, if we were, we will talk about success in a public procurement system, we have to measure competitivity. So uh, we, we already observed incredibly an increase of competitivity in the public procurement system. Normally we have an average of 2.6 offers per procurement process. It is, I know it is very, very low, but we also include in the average the direct, uh, the direct procurement. So 2.6 is all average. In the last, uh, the last process for the virtual store, we have 43 offers. So we are we are uh, we are observing an increased level of, of competitivity in the procurement during the crisis. So we uh, this is an indicator that make us believe that we are having success. But this indicator should be measured at the end. I don't know why, but at the end, oh, sorry, I don't know when, but at the end of the of the crisis, it should be measured to 
uh, understand what happened with competitivity that for me is one of the main indicators in the public procurement system. Another indicator is not very easy, easy to measure, but uh, you may feel it, it are the social networks. We, we, didn't, we didn't exist for the social network. Public procurement system didn't exist for the, uh, for the social network. Now we have a main role in the social networks when they speak about uh, public administration. So uh, as I told before, this is an opportunity to involve a citizen in the public procurement, in the public administration. So it is also, it is also a, a point that we have to, to measure and to observe uh, what is going on with the social network. Of course, with all the, the regards and warning that we have to take into account when we speak about social network, avoid trolls, uh, focus on, on serious, uh, on serious and, and absolutely real uh, users, et cetera, et cetera. And, but I believe that how to measure success is a question that shall be replied and will be much uh, replied in a much better way by the open data specialist. Uh, what to measure in a public procurement system is, is a question that I don't know if it has limit to answer, to reply, because the way that can be Combine the data uh, are enormous, uh, and and I still believe that Jason is a is a character of a scary movie. But open data specialist uh, knows in a better way how to use it, and I'm sure that they may they they may share us a, a better reply about how to measure. How to measure is uh, is probably the next step of the development development of public procurement system. Uh, in the first step, we, we all uh, consider how to procure. In the second step, we, we consider what to show. And in the third step, I think what to measure regarding a public procurement system will be the key in the new development that start basically from this time from all. Thank you so much, Pablo, for sharing those points. Um, before we go to the, the other question, um, one of the things we wanted to do was hear from everybody on the call about what they thought were the most important things to do uh, to ensure open budgeting and open contracting through the through the crisis. So I think our friends at the OGP Secretariat are going to share a poll with you now over the Zoom. And uh, we were be really grateful to get your insights from your experience, what you think are the most key things that we need to focus on together. There was one other question um, from the chat as well that we wanted to make sure that the panelists address, and that was the one about uh, inclusive inclusiveness. Uh, before the crisis, during the crisis, and after the crisis, we want to make sure that budgeting and uh, public contracting is responsive um, to the needs of everyone, uh, not just the majority. So that includes uh, women, women-led organizations, it includes um, Indigenous and Indigenous-led organizations, and other uh, minority groups, whether then that could be a variety of different characteristics. Um, so I'm curious, and maybe uh, panelists, uh, you could just indicate by raising a hand if you have something you want to, um, in particular, uh, share on that point. Okay, so I see Pablo has raised his hand. So first, I'm going to go over to Lorena, if you could uh, on Ukram raise his hand too. And we only have seven minutes left, so we're running short on time. Um, but but uh, I'm going to go first to Lorena to maybe share some thoughts on, on how to overcome the challenges in federal context. And then we're going to go um, very quickly back to Ikram and Pablo to answer the question about inclusion. So Lorena, over to you. I'm going to unmute you now. Great. I'm going to be very fast. I, I want to go to the inclusion thing. On the federalized, it, it's a huge topic because in, in many countries, the processes are not mapped. So uh, the question was how to control. So first of all, map the processes and then you can map the data. So first is identify who is responsible for which service. If there are transfers between different levels of government, which are the transfers that happen or which taxes are local? So revenue from this local, where is it coming from? And then with that, if you follow the cash, you can 
see the flow of data. In some cases, um, though in most countries this does not happen, the reporting goes to the federal government. In, in most cases, it stays at the local government. So the frustration sometimes comes when this information is only at the local government and we ask the federal government to give us information that they do not have because it's someone else's responsibility. So if we map the processes, we can knock on the right door. Uh, ideally, we will someday have a consolidation of this whole flows of, of the data do, do, uh, and be able to compile it all together. And one last thing is some local, local governments might even have better transparency uh, initiatives and uh, even of data than the federal government. So make use of this if you have the right process in the local government. So we can go to the vulnerable people. Thank you so much, Lorena, for that great advice. Um, all right, so over uh, to Ikram, if you could really share uh, very briefly about um, the response on the question for inclusion, and then we'll go to Pablo to also answer that question. Thank you, Lindsay. Very quickly, I mean, on, on, on inclusion, I think when we talk about inclusion it has to be meaningful and, and um, that we can ensure as civil society organizations to facilitate it at the local level. But we also need to have, um, we, we need to institutionalize this. We have been talking about a public participation and budgeting process for years now. Uh, and the government has, um, you know, in Afghanistan, for example, um, has held consultations with the, with the people without really reflecting uh, the outcome of those consultations into the budgeting process. Because, you know, it's, it's not something that, that, that is very clear in the, in the laws in, in Afghanistan, uh, uh, how this information would feed into, um, into the budgeting process. And we don't have, we have a very centralized government, very centralized budget. We don't have provincial budgeting, for example, and we're pushing for that. So I think getting um, inclusion, uh, inclusion um, institutionalized, um, and and uh, uh, you know government practices. I think that that's very important um, you know, way forward. Thank you so much. And looking at the time, I just realized, Pablo, there is not time to go back to you to answer that question. But maybe you could share your advice about it in the chat uh, for everybody's benefit. And I'm actually going to hand it back over to Claire now uh, to share the results of our poll and um, and and ask everybody on the call one last question. Great. Oh, thanks so much. So this has been very exciting and great to hear from everyone. Thank you so much for your inputs on the poll as well. The people have spoken. We know we want open data on contracts and budgets. We know we want stronger audit and oversight mechanisms. We know we want support for civic monitoring initiatives and engagement. So this has been a powerful call for all of us to ensure that we have greater transparency of key information that the citizens and people want more opportunities for meaningful, inclusive participation mechanisms, more engagement and oversight mechanisms uh, and practices that are sustained over the long term. This means structural reforms and, and tackling the complexity that we've been addressing over this call. Uh, one final question as well, it's, it's please do share any final lessons or advice you have for us, all of us who are united in this response and, and recovery from the global pandemic. We'd love to hear more from you. Please do stay in touch with us and continue to, to share your links and materials and resources. And we look forward to, to staying in touch as we strengthen open and accountable budgeting and contracting for the future. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.